Soldiers of the Press. This week, Torpedo. Yes, what is it? It's control, sir. They've spotted something. Oh, yes? What? The rangefinder's picked up two unidentified planes, sir. Left of convoy, angle of elevation five degrees. Very well. Tell the guns to stand by. Aye, aye, sir. Stand by, gun stations. Ranges and speed of those planes. Aye, aye, sir. Ranges and speed of those planes. Am I in the way, Captain? Hmm? Oh, uh, not at all, Palmer. You better stay close. Looks as if a story might be coming up. Visitors dropping in. Friends, I hope. (laughs) Too soon to tell yet. Signalmen on a convoy to scatter. Aye, aye, sir. Plane still unidentified, but have German characteristics. Sound general quarters. All guns standing by, sir. Very well. Range? Range, I. Report range. Range, 10,000 yards. Altitude, 15,000 feet. Speed, 2, 2, 0. Commence tracking. Commence tracking. Range, 5,000 yards. Speed, two, three, zero. Plains are German. Action stations. Range, 3,000 yards. 4,000 yards. 5,000 hmm, yards. What's that? Oh, look at that now. 6,000 They're running yards. away. The Jerry's are running 7, away. 7,000 yards. Range, I'll be damned. 8,000 yards. Long. Not torpedo planes at all. Range, JU-52s probably 9, taking Germans to Italy. Yards. Speed. No story for you this Two, time, Palmer. Three, Another time, zero. perhaps. I hope not, my boy. Range. I hope not. Secure from general quarters. Secure from Speed. general quarters. Secure Two, from general quarters. Three, zero. During the past months, we have brought you many stories by correspondents of the United Press. A plane crashed in northern Burma, and UP flashed you the story. A UP correspondent managed to slip across the Swiss border into German-held Italy, and you walked with him into Como. In short... United Press correspondents have been in almost every conceivable kind of action, from a foxhole outside Munda to a giant bomber over Rome. And in every case, you have been given a first-hand account of what took place. This time, we have a different story to tell, a story filed by George Palmer of the United Press. This is a story of how it feels to be aboard a convoy ship and of how it feels to be torpedoed. How does it feel to be torpedoed? Well, in the first place, you don't believe you have caught a fish. That's what they call being torpedoed, catching a fish. You're sure you've hit an iceberg, only it's too hot for icebergs. Well, anyway, you run. You run for the part of the ship that's sticking farthest out of the water. In this case, it was the starboard side that was high. It happened like this. Our cruiser was speeding through a choppy sea, and in the frightening grayness that covered us, I stood talking to the surgeon commander an old friend of mine. This night he seemed nervous, almost as if he was expecting... I don't know. He was very nervous. I'm what? Nervous. I said you were nervous. I? Why, this trip is nothing. Last time I was on a convoy going to Malta and... What's that out there? Cruiser? Over there? Looks like a destroyer. Then it's a cruiser. It's been painted, camouflaged. Dark out, isn't it? Yeah. Wish it was dawn. It's barely dusk. Yeah, I know. Wish it was dawn. So do I, George. When we had that false alarm before, I was sure those two German torpedo planes and... No, I'd like a cigarette right now. You can't smoke on deck, you know. We blacked out. Yeah, I know. I had to go down to my bunk to get one, but... No, oh, well, I'll skip it. What? What were you going to say? Well, it sounds kind of stupid, but you see, there's a certain spot of paint in the wall of my cabin. Well, I keep thinking somebody's going to stick a torpedo right through that spot. Sounds stupid, doesn't it? Stupid? Not at all. Every man thinks of something like that when he's in danger, George. Every man. Oh, but this trip is fine. Fine. The last convoy operation I was on was known by the code word vigorous. And it was, too. We were attacked repeatedly by hundreds of German bombers. Well, that one was vigorous, all right. I was just saying to the captain today that since it had lived up to its name so well, 
Perhaps we should call this trip serene. Yeah, it has been serene, all right. No trouble at all. Hold me up! No trouble at all. And that's when we caught the fish. As I said before, I dashed uphill for the higher you up, higher up you go, the better when you hit icebergs you know aren't there. Then I was noise. And I became aware of sickening smells, vile smells, frightening sounds, the shouts of men, wounded men, and the steady cracking of our pom-poms. I grabbed the cable that rimmed the deck, felt the grease in my hand, and looked down into the swirling back sea. Thick smoke belched out from our starboard bows, and I saw great gushes of orange flame lighting up the sea. Between the spits of fire, the sea was black and greasy, and I kept looking into the sea and thinking about how glad I was I could swim. Swim. We're listing badly now, and the smoke is thicker than ever. Now a solid block of men pushed toward me along the deck. I called to them. Hey, come on. We've got to swim for it. Come on, let's go. Nobody heard me. So I put one leg over the rail and kind of talked to myself. Jump out far, I said. Jump away from the ship, and don't forget to hold your life belt with one hand so it won't come up and smack you in the chin. And you got to swim like hell. Come on, boy. You can do it. Ready now. Jump. I wouldn't do that if I were you. Huh? be rather lonely down there, all by yourself. Leaning against a rail, nice and calm, was a young officer. I looked at him. So calm he was. Well, how about it? Are we going in? Hell no. Nobody goes over until the captain says so. The steadiness of his voice was pretty reassuring. I pulled my leg back onto the deck. What was it, submarine? One airplane. Darn. But it was a sub. No, a torpedo plane. No one knew he was up there. Holy cow. Quite. He got away. Things were quieting down a bit now. We pulled ourselves together. The damage control party was already hard at work fighting fire and dragging bodies out of the mess where the torpedo struck. I went below to help carry blankets to the quarter deck. Up there, some of the casualties were in mourning. Some were crying hysterically. And one to whom I gave cigarettes. Look, Mike, do me a favor, will you? Tell my girl, her name was Anna. Tell her to write to me. I haven't got any letters from her. And she'd ought to write. Tell her that, will you? Tell her to write to me. The boy died there on the deck. Many boys died that night. Among them, my friend the surgeon commander. And hundreds of men were injured. The captain was badly injured, but nevertheless was hard at work. He was barking orders to a group of men, explaining how they were to steer the ship with their voices. You see, all our steering apparatus had been destroyed by the fire, but it was still possible to steer the ship by hand. And that was what the captain was telling her. All right. Have you got that? As soon as the destroyer sends a signal, the lieutenant will pick it up and call it to you, Jones. You, in turn, will call it to the seamen stationed amidships. He will shout it to you, Anderson. You will call it down the hatch. Lieutenant. Yes, sir? I want you to pick out three of the huskiest men on the ship. Yes, sir. Smith, Bob Brown, White. Here they are, Captain. Thank you. You three men, I'm asking you to go down below and steer us home with your hands. Aye, aye, sir. How will we know the course, sir? The destroyer is standing by us. They'll signal the course by Lucas Lamp. The lieutenant will pick it up and relay it to the next man, and so on. You will get the course by relays, then it'll be up to you. Can you do it? <laughs> sure we can do it, sir. Come on, me, boys. Absolutely. And that's how it was done. The explosion and flames had destroyed the wheelhouse and all our steering apparatus. But those three men went down below the quarter deck, deep down to where the massive machinery which turns the rudder was housed. And there they waited for the signal. Has it come yet, Lieutenant? No, not yet. Wait a minute. No. Yes, there it is. Left to base course. Left to base course. Zero, six, two. Left to base course. Zero, six, two. Left to base course. Zero, six, two. Left to base course. Steady on base course. Steady as she goes. Steady as she goes. Steady as she goes. And all night long, orders were shouted down to those three sweating men who were steering the fire-wrecked ship with their hands. 
Meanwhile, the men forward had managed to put the fires out, and somehow they shifted the ballast enough so that the list in the ship was imperceptible. And so, painfully, slowly, we crawled into port, safe. Well, that's a story. But that isn't all of it. What about the incredibly horrible experience every man on board went through? The things we saw. Things we can't forget. The sight of brave, grown men screaming for their mothers and sweethearts as they died. And above all, one incident stands out most vividly in my mind. Two hours after we were hit, the chaplain who did magnificent work attending the dying men grew tired and relaxed for a moment. We stood there in the cool wind, watching the sea. The chaplain, pondering over the 160 men who had died, the many others who were seriously burned, and the hundreds aboard who were dog-tired and sick at heart, looked about him at the flame skyed warship. And he looked up at the sky, up at the moon amongst the broken clouds. Looked upward for, for a full minute. Then he turned to me and said, And to think that one man, just one man, up there in the machine, did all this. Thousands of other United Press correspondents like George Palmer are sharing the dangers of frontline action with our boys from the Mediterranean to the South Pacific. Every day, these UP soldiers of the press send dispatches to the home front, telling the tales of daily heroism which make for final victory. So be sure to look for United Press news in your favorite newspaper and to listen for United Press dispatches on the air. They are your guarantee of the world's best coverage of the world's biggest news. 